Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Beverly Howard. We're going to do a Bible study. We're in chapter 13 of Mark. It's a great and interesting chapter. Jesus is going to talk about the end times. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, most of you, uh, if you're a believer, you're interested in that subject. Eschatology is the religious term for it, I think. We're in uh, we're going to focus on verses 24 through 37, but I I tend to add some other verses to kind of put it in context, but the title of the lesson is Returning. Before we get started on the lesson, I wanted to let everybody know that my mom passed away yesterday. She's 94 years old, and it truly was her desire to depart from this world and to be with Christ, because as Paul says, that's much better by far. So, for us left behind, uh, family and friends, we will miss her greatly. She was a, an awesome mother and a wonderful person. Yes. So, uh, so mom, I know you're with Jesus, so I hope you're having a ball. <laughs> so let's start with chapter 13. Where are we in the Gospel of Mark? Well, uh, if you've been following along, part one of Mark deals with the person, explaining to us who the person of Christ is. Part two deals with Jesus teaching his disciples about the plan. The plan, of course, is for him to die on the cross and three days later be raised from the dead. And because of that plan, he took our sin upon himself. He paid for the punishment of our sins by his death because he was sinless. And then because uh, God forgave that sin in Christ, he was sinless. God raised him from the dead. So we now have the ability through believing, through faith, to receive that eternal life that was, was promised. So now part three, after Jesus gets through teaching about the plan, and, and this is the last week of his life, so he's actually implementing the plan, but he's now turned his attention and his focus to explaining what's going to happen, which is the power, when he rises from the dead, the power of God is going to be released in the world, not only in the hearts of believers, but throughout the world, he is going to release his power. And we're going to live in this age where the Holy Spirit changes people's lives. And the power of God is all about that, or that's all about the power of God. So today's lesson, he's going to turn, talk about the power that comes uh, when he comes back for the second time. Wow, that is the real power there. Okay, so where are we exactly? Well, geographically, we're in Jerusalem. It's Passover week. It's Wednesday evening. Of, remember, he's crucified on Friday. So it's Wednesday evening. He's sitting with his disciples during these focal verses on the Mount of Olives. And now his public ministry is complete. He will spend the rest of his time, uh, remember uh, the Last Supper, with his disciples. And then, of course, he'll be betrayed, arrested, tried, crucified, and then resurrected. So his public ministry is complete. He's, he can close that chapter out of his life and start this next chapter. Kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So at this moment, when he does, when he talks to his disciples about what's going to come next, they are sitting uh, on the mountainside of the, the Mount of Olives, uh, probably in the Garden of Gethsemane, but we're not told. And they're looking across the valley to uh, the uh, temple. Now, this is a current picture of about what it would have looked like at sunset if there had been a temple here, but there's not a temple there. There's the Dome of the Rock, and the Dome of the Rock is Muslim, and it's a, it's a place where they believe and it, part of it they got right. Abraham was told to, uh, to sacrifice his son Isaac. Well, Muslims believe that it wasn't Isaac, it was Ishmael. So uh, the Muslim faith does not believe that Jesus is salvation, that he is the son of God. Now they believe some things about Jesus, but they don't believe that. So they have a false religion about Jesus when it comes to the gospel. So there's a little... Uh, 
thing here that we can call the abomination of desolation, if you'd like to call it that. Now, what was left of the temple? Well, Jesus is going to tell them that not one stone is going to be left upon the other, but there was a wall behind the temple that led into the rest of Jerusalem that they spared, they being the Romans, spared. And it's the western wall, and you can see this is from the other side. The Mount of Olives is in the background. So that's all that remains, and that's why it's so... Uh, sacred to the Jews because that's as much of the temple area as they've got left, which is a wall that's not really part of the temple, but the wall that surrounds it. Now, Jesus is about to tell his disciples a lot of things about the end times, but he's not going to be comprehensive in his discussion because he's got a point that he wants to make. And if he was going to be comprehensive, he'd literally have to tell them everything that we find in the book of Revelation. And he just doesn't have that kind of time left. <clears throat> so he knows that John's going to be given that information. So he's going to tell them enough to make his point. And, and we shouldn't get lost in the interpretive weeds here. We should really watch for the point that Jesus is trying to make. And I'm going to try my best to, to, to stay at that level. So he does talk about the church age, which is going to begin at Pentecost, the destruction of the temple, which happens in 70 AD. But then in, in Mark, he's not going to talk about the rapture, but he does, Matthew does cover that. So he did cover it in the conversation, but not in Mark's conversation. And then the tribulation, he's going to hit that really hard, the wrath of God. And then he's going to talk about the final, or when Jesus comes back the second time to to really end Armageddon, okay? This is going to be his, he's going to return uh, for with the believers for a thousand years, and then Armageddon's going to happen, and then the destruction of the universe shortly follows thereafter. The things I've got grayed out here are things that he doesn't mention, at least Mark doesn't mention that he mentions them. So let's keep going. Now, what about this study of end times? Is this something that a Christian should uh, tolerate or just, you know, roll your eyes and say, I'll never understand any of that. And, you know, let's just go back and talk about things that I can understand. Well, <clears throat> we find out in Revelation chapter one, verse three, that this is prophecy, which is by the way, 28% of the Bible. Okay. It's a fourth, more than a fourth of the Bible. Uh, we can't rip that out. This is important for us to understand. So even though sometimes it's complicated, it's important to us. And why is it important? Revelation 1.3 says, if we will study it, blessed is the one who reads it aloud. In other words, blessed is the one who teaches prophecy, the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, those who hear it and understand it, who take it to heart what is written in it. Why? Because, and this is the point that Jesus is going to make, because the time is near, we need to be getting ourselves Ready, And we need to be getting to the extent that we can, the world around us, the people that we love ready because the time is near. So here's how the story really begins in chapter 13, verse one. And this is kind of the lead up into the focal verses. Verse, verse one is Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple. Remember his, his public uh, ministry is over. One of his disciples said to him, look, and as they go down into the valley, he said, look back at this temple. He said, look, what massive, stones, what magnificent buildings. Well, they were. I mean, this was Herod's temple. It was amazingly beautiful at that time. It had just been completed, and some people say it wasn't completed until a little bit later, but it is amazingly beautiful, and they're just reacting to the beauty of the temple, and uh, Jesus has to unfortunately burst their bubble, and so by the way, one lesson that I picked up, one point that I picked up from this lesson is a lot of times we'll look at some things that men create in this world, uh, whether it's the, the Twin Towers in New York or, you know, some Titanic ship that, uh, you know, God, of course, could not sink uh, because it was built so well. And, uh, you know, we look at all these man-made things and we think to ourselves, that is very impressive. And then we realize what Jesus is about to say is going to happen to all of those man-made things, whether it's the temple or the Twin Towers or the Titanic. Jesus says to them, do you see, this is, they're all walking towards the, uh, uh, the Mount of Olives, do you see all of these great buildings, not just the temple, but the whole city of Jerusalem? Jesus re replied, Jesus, not one stone here will be left on another. Every stone, every one of them will be 
destroyed, thrown down. And we know that that happened in 70 AD. But his disciples go, whoa, really? And in verse 3, as Jesus, now they've made it all the way across. They're sitting, they're looking back at the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, they're watching the sunset, probably. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him and asked him privately, uh, teacher, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? In other words, we, we, we want to be prepared for this ahead of time. And then Jesus goes on in the following verses, and they're not part of the focal verses, but I wanted to cover in general what he says. He goes on and he says, okay, there's, there will be birthing pains. In other words, before the end of the age, before the end of the earth, before the final judgment, there will be things that are occurring. And he says those things will be things like wars and rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes everywhere. The earth will shake and, and just be uh, in the throes of this birth. Uh, so there will be famines and pestilences. And, and in Luke chapter 21, uh, Luke says that Jesus said, there are just going to be a lot of fearful events. Boy, aren't you glad that we don't have any of those things today? And then he says, so not only is there, are there going to be all these fearful events, but he says there's also going to be great spiritual deception. There will be huge religious faiths that deny the the divinity of Jesus and deny the the fact that he died for our sins. So there will be a lot of those, and we can see those, whether it's the Muslim faith or, or the Hindu faith, that there will be a lot of faiths that deny the gospel. There will be false messiahs. There will be people coming along that say, I am Jesus returning, and there will be false prophets Signs and wonders, they will provide signs and wonders and miracles. Now, we know from Revelation that that's um, who that is, who that turns out to be. Uh, many will be deceived, he says, uh, Jesus tells them. So be careful to stick close to the gospel message. So whenever someone starts wandering away from the pure gospel message that about what Jesus did, what God did through Jesus, make sure that you get pulled back in. Uh, they're going to be very convincing because of their miracles and their signs. And then so not only will there be fearful events, not only will there be false uh, religions, false prophets, false teachers, but there will also be a lot of persecution for believers. Believers will be flogged, arrested, family will betray family, and everyone, he says, will hate you because of me. So those are the three things, he says, that you ought to look for. And lo and behold, every generation has those things. Every generation of believers experiences those, and every generation of believer lives in times where there are wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all that. But Jesus said this, he says, you can be assured that the end will not come until the gospel has been explained, preached, uh, made known to all nations. And that's why there are a lot of missionary organizations that are wanting to get out and make sure that every part of the earth is covered with the gospel message. And so then the disciples say, well, then what should we do? And this is the point of the lesson. This is the point that Jesus is trying to get across to them, and he's trying to get across to us. And so as believers, uh, we sometimes can get mired down into the, the minutia of the end times. And we should. We should understand that. We should study Revelation and get to the details of the thousand years and, you know, and uh, the rapture and all those things. But Jesus wants to make a different point here, and we need to stick with what he's making. Watch out, he says, uh, for false religions. Be on your guard, he says in verse 9 and 23. Stand firm, he says in verse 13. Be alert in verse 33. And then he says repeatedly, at least three times, he says, watch, watch, watch. So you want to know what Jesus is telling them, the message he's trying to get across to them? It could happen anytime. Therefore, be alert. Watch. Be about the Father's business. Don't sit back and say, well, I guess he's not coming anytime soon. I can do whatever I want to do. No, he's coming soon. So watch. Be careful. So then he goes on in verse 17 to talk about the time that we know in Revelation is called the tribulation. He says, the tribulation days will be days of distress that are unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and they'll never be equaled 
after that. If the Lord hadn't cut short the tribulation, no one, no one would have survived. And we know from Revelation there, a fourth of the earth is killed, a third of the earth is killed, the, the, the living creatures are killed, the trees are killed. Uh, and uh, what Jesus says, if, if God hadn't stopped, it would have resulted in the total annihilation of everything and everyone. But for the sake of the elect, for the sake of those who were yet to believe, whom he has chosen, he has shortened those days. And now we know about the thousand year reign and he gave people after the tribulation a chance to examine the truth again and to change their mind and receive Christ as savior. So rapture, tribulation, and the end, those are the things he's talked about. But let's get started with the vocal verses of the day, which talk about mostly the end. So verse 24, but in those days following that distress, in other words, in those days after the tribulation, okay, the sun then will be darkened and the moon will not give its life. So he's talking about the very end here. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. This is, this is the ultimate destruction of not only the earth, but the entire universe. At that time, people will see me coming in the clouds with great, what, power and glory. And this will be the second final return of Jesus. And then he says this on the final day, he said he'll send his angels and he'll gather the elect from the four winds. Now this is the elect that were saved during the, tribula the, during the uh, thousand year reign or the tribulation and the thousand year reign. Tribulation is only seven years. He says he'll gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth and from the ends of the heaven. And we'll be with him in heaven. It, those of us who are raptured or die like mom did uh, before the rapture, okay, we'll all be gathered together with him there. So he's going to gather all of us together. And we will be uh, safe with him while he goes through this destruction and recreation. So then he stops here and then he says, <clears throat> he says, okay, I've told you all this thing, all these things that are going to happen, but I, I want to tell you a story. And the story is a very, has three really important points. He says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. Ha, another oh, fig tree. I know. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. And he's going to say, so you can see the signs of all of this before it happens because you will see it coming from a distance. Even so, when you see these things happen, he says, in other words, just the same way that when you see the leaves budding out on the fig tree, then, and you see these things happening, you'll know that it is what? It's near. It's right outside the door. It's about to happen. But then he goes on to say that we won't know the time, but he makes an interesting statement here. Say, because so he's summarizing and he says, truly, I tell you, remember what we said about truly, I tell you, verily, verily, I say, okay. it's going to be on the test. Write it down. This is very important. Listen carefully. He doesn't want you to take what he's about to say and toss it out or toss it away because you, we don't understand it. So we need to pay a special attention, pay special attention to this verse. Truly, I tell you, this generation, now generation can mean a 40-year generation or it can mean a, an age, okay, but and we don't know exactly what he's talking about here, will certainly not pass away. In other words, this generation of 40 years will not pass away or this generation of the age will not pass away until what? All of the things that we've been talking about up till now, from the very first thing I said, which is not one stone will be left on the other until what I said about I'm coming back a second time, all of those things will have happened. How in the world is that even possible? It's been 2,000 years almost since Jerusalem was destroyed. And the answer to that, I think, and by the way, there are a lot of commentaries on this, but I think clearly what he was talking about has two separate meanings. This is not unusual for a prophecy. If you go back to Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Daniel all of those prophecies dealt with the exile of Judah, and but they weren't really dealing with that particular exile, just that exile. They were also dealing with the whole exile that happened in AD 70. So they had two different meanings. Well, Jesus, I think, in this prophecy was talking about two different events. First event was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and the disciples took this message seriously. When 70 AD, when they saw 
the revolt against the Romans, and they saw all of those things happen. They saw the Roman army guard, uh, gathering. The Christian church fled. They fled Jerusalem, and because they fled Jerusalem, the gospel was spread all over that part of the world, and that was a good thing. So the, the apostles took this seriously, that the, the temple was going to be destroyed. In their generation, and it happened, well, you remember when Jesus was upset about the Israelites not going into the promised land, he said, truly nobody from this generation will enter the promised land. And so they wandered in the desert for how long? 40 years. 40 years. From the time that Jesus told the disciples this, it was 40 years until the, until the uh, destruction of the temple. So one meaning of what he was saying when he says this verse is that pay attention that the, within your generation, apostles, uh, it's going to be destroyed. Second meaning, however, I think goes much, much further because he's talking about the end times when he's going to return. And we know 2,000 years later, he hasn't yet returned. We haven't been raptured. <laughs> At least I hope not. We haven't been raptured. <laughs> okay, that would be a sad thing. We yeah. haven't been raptured. And so Christians, the church is still here and we're still doing our job, but we need to pay close attention because the time is near. And it's going to happen quickly. Once it starts, once the rapture hits till the end, is going to be one generation. Now, how does that even possible with a thousand year reign? Well, the good news is Jesus is king and death is going to be suspended during the tribulation. That doesn't mean nobody's going to die. It just means that it, people will live a really, really long time. So the generation time, 40 years goes to 400 or a thousand years. Pretty interesting, huh? Neat stuff. And then he goes on to say, after he says, truly, all of these things will happen in, the next, in this generation, then he goes on to say this. <clears throat> you know those beautiful buildings that you, uh, that you really admire? You know those huge skyscrapers that you think are just great? You know those great ships that you think are so awesome? Well, guess what? Heavens and earth, they're all going to pass away. Part of the judgment. But he says, but I can tell you something that won't pass away. Every word that I say, because my words are God's words, and they are eternal. So we got a choice. We can look at the beautiful buildings and the great towers and the great ships and all of man's accomplishments and put our trust in those, but I'm telling you, those are going to be destroyed. Whether it was the Tower of Babel or the Temple or the Titanic, or the Twin Towers, or whatever man builds next, it'll be, it'll be beautiful, it'll be great, it'll be amazing, but it will not be lasting. Nor will our earthly lives. So, I'm making a point here. And then he says this, he says, all of these things except, let me let you know that, but about that day, or that hour, the specific moment, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor nor I. I don't know either. Only the Father knows the answer to that. But I'm going to tell you what my point is in telling you all of this. I'm going to tell you what I want you to walk away with. I'm going to tell you what I want you to remember. Verily, verily, I say, I want you to remember this. Be on your guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. And he tells this wonderful parable. It's either in Matthew or in Luke about uh, the bridegroom and the virgins with the oil in the lamps. So he's talking, you know, you don't know. So you got to be prepared. He says, it's like a man going away and he leaves his house and he puts his servants in charge. Well, guess what? Jesus left his house and he put his servants, that's us believers in charge, each with their assigned task. All of us are saved unto works that are prepared ahead of time for us to do. And he tells the one at the door, that means the one uh, part of us that's looking out for his return, keep watch. Therefore, I'm telling you, keep watch because you don't know when the owner of the house is going to come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Be on your guard. And then he finishes this way. Christ's return is not if he's going to return. It's simply when. And then he finishes and summarizes everything he said by this. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. All of the prophecies in all of the Bible 
point to this. And all the prophecies have been fulfilled except for this. Are you willing to take the risk that there's one out of thousands of prophecies that won't actually happen? And the answer is, I'm not going to take that bet. My faith tells me that if he did everything else that he said he was going to do, he will do this. So let me summarize. <clears throat> in time events, God has given us a clear picture of what will happen at the end. And we have that story in Revelation and parts of many of the other books of the Bible. He wants us to know the what. He really does want us to know the what. or Otherwise, he wouldn't have made it so clear. And he wants to know the why. This is God's wrath on a sinful world. And he wants us to know where. Where it's going to happen is Jerusalem. Okay, that's going to be where the Armageddon happens and that just that part of the world and then but the when the when he says we don't know and because we don't know he says I want you to watch diligently because it could be and it will be soon Mark 13 is focused on the watch Jesus is not giving a detailed explanation of the end times that happens in Revelation Daniel Ezekiel other books of the Bible he is making a point to his disciples and to us once the gospel has been shared to the world, the end could come anytime, anytime. He says this, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So pay attention, folks. So we're going to do two applications, an application for believers and an application for unbelievers. First application is Jesus left us in charge. Well, that's a little scary. He leave, the good news is, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He comes to live in our hearts and he brings his Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God living in us. So we've got a counselor, we've got a guide, we've got someone who can lead us. So he didn't leave us without that. So he leaves us in his house, that would be the church, okay? Then he leaves his servants, that would be the believers, in charge. We're in charge of what? We're in charge of explaining the gospel message and living a righteous life and through our li righteous lives to explain or to prove the gospel message is true. And then each sermon he says is assigned a task. And if you're a Christian and you don't know your task, you need to get on your knees and pray that God will show it to you because it's there. We just You just might not have seen it. So that's the application for believers. The application for unbelievers is, are you serious? Can you not see this coming? 40 years after he said this was going to happen, it happened. The temple and Jerusalem were both destroyed and they haven't been rebuilt yet. Although we're pretty sure they will be. In 1948, Israel for the first time in 2000 years became a, so over 2000 years, became a sovereign nation. Uh, nations all around Israel vow to destroy it. Folks, Look at the current war with Hamas, okay? And all of the nations, all of the Arab nations around are threatening to annihilate Israel. This could be it, okay? And there are fearful events. I don't know about you, but I just watch the news. There are fearful events everywhere. So seriously, I'm telling you, if you're not a believer, can you not see this coming I mean, I can see this every day. How bad are gonna, things going to get when all Christians... Now, think about this. The rapture comes next before the tribulation. How bad, how bad are things going to get when every Christian in the world gets taken up to heaven along with, remember, the Holy Spirit where lives here in us. The Holy Spirit of God is going to leave the earth with us, the believers, when the rapture happens, the earth is going to be left with no Holy Spirit and no Christians to hold Satan back. So no then, no restraint. So then God will be freed to release the wrath on the earth. But there is a way out for those of you who don't yet believe. <clears throat> He says it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That would be Jesus, okay? That whoever believes in him shall not perish or go through God's wrath. We are not supposed to endure God's wrath. We are saved from God's wrath, and then we are going to live eternally with God. So the lesson is this. It's all going to end. So watch out. Pay attention. For believers, it means for us to be about God's business. 
Pray with me. Father, thank you for this message. Uh, I know we can get easily wound into the details of your coming back, and we'd love to know that information. Uh, and we anticipate it, and we look forward to it, and we want you to come back soon. But, Father, the message that Jesus gives his disciples and us is to always be on alert because it could happen today. So, Father, let us be about your business. Don't let us get lazy or backslide or, or get confused about what's important. What's important is the gospel message and telling everybody that the end is coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I know that was long, but to me it was important. So we'll see you next week. We'll do chapter 14. Take care. Love you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.